programs for the Terry Menace, who is the Senior Director of Census and Voting Programs for the Asian American Advancing uh, Justice Program, and Mr. Tom Sines. Uh, Tom is the is, is today is representing MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Uh, let me thank these three individuals for joining us today, as well as our members. Before we get started, for the members of the media who are on the call, after we make brief opening remarks, we intend to answer some of your questions. Uh, please utilize the Q&A function on Zoom to pose your question, uh, and staff, our faithful staff, will unmute and recognize you uh, for that opportunity at the appropriate time. Let me, let me begin by explaining to you the committed jurisdiction and process as it relates to HR1 and HR4. First, let's talk about HR1. And we all know HR1 is For the People Act. This legislation originated in the House Committee on Administration, our committee, uh, chaired by Chair uh, Zoe Lofren of California. Uh, the legislation was passed by the House on March 3rd, 2021, and delivered to the Senate. Now, this is absolutely necessary uh, legislation uh, that will stem the attack on our democracy. Weekly, each week, we see states that are, that are passing laws that restrict access to the ballot box. An overwhelming majority of Americans, including majorities of independents, I might say, and, and Republicans, as well as Democrats, recognize that voting rights in the United States are under threat. That's why we urge all senators, Democratic senators, Republican senators, to quickly pass H.R. 1 and send it to the president for his signature. Now, let me just talk for a couple of minutes about H.R. 4, uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Over the past few months, many of you have asked me, uh, when will H.R. 4 be introduced in the 117th Congress? Uh, that question certainly deserves some background to be answered. Uh, in 1965, in 1965, a bipartisan Congress passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, 56 years ago today. By any definition, this legislation was historic. Historic because in 1965, millions of African American citizens were not eligible to become registered voters because of the literacy test. Well, under the Voting Rights Act, the test was abolished. It was also historic because the legislation breathed life into the 15th Amendment, which states the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. It went on to say, that's the, 13th, the 15th Amendment, it went on to say Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The Voting Rights Act included many provisions, and now I will explain Section 2 and Section 5. Section 2. This provision under the Voting Rights Act is, is based on the powers granted by the 15th Amendment. It enables voters of color, color to litigate any grievances, any complaints regarding voting practices and procedures. Early in this jurisprudence, the Supreme Court ruled that plaintiffs must prove intentional discrimination to prevail in a Section 2 case. Well, in 1982, and I remember it so well, I was seated in the gallery of the United States Senate watching the debate. In 1982, a bipartisan group of senators sponsored legislation that lowered the proof in voting cases to proof of discriminatory effect or result. Well, it passed Congress, and it passed overwhelmingly with nearly 389 yes votes in the House. 85 yes votes in the Senate. Signing the reauthorization into law, President Reagan observed that for this nation to remain true to its principles, we cannot allow any American's vote to be denied, diluted, or defiled, end of quote. That was President Reagan. And that the right to vote, he went on to say, the right to vote is the crown jewel of American liberties and we will not 
see its luster diminished. Because of the 1982 revision, minority plaintiffs have prevailed all across the country in dozens, dozens of voting rights cases. At the same time, the act has strengthened, was strengthened and served as a deterrent against the passage of new voter suppression measures. Subsequent reauth reauthorizations were again passed by Congress with overwhelming bipartisan majorities and signed into law by Republican presidents. You may recall in 2006, uh, there was a bipartisan effort to reauthorize Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And that has been since I have been in Congress. And uh, we have been able to, uh, to benefit from, from that work. I'm just going to show you if I can. Um, and I thought I had it available to you. Uh, I want to show you uh, a picture of that bill signing in, in 2006. And there it is. I was there on the third or fourth row. There is President Bush signing the reauthorization in 2006. There is Senator Leahy to your left. You see Simpson Brenner in the middle. And to the right, you will see uh, uh, other United States senators as well. That was a great day in Congress. It was the, a bipartisan effort in 2006 to extend for 25 years the protections of Section 5. I also, after that took place, uh, got a copy of the legislation, and I have it among my archives. And that legislation, uh, which was H.R. 9, and it may have had a separate number in the Senate, uh, it also passed. And on this bill, it has the signature of John Boehner, of, of Denny Hastert, of, of Jim Sensenbrenner, and the Democratic leadership. It was a bipartisan effort in 2006. But last month, last month, on July 1st, 2021, the United States Supreme Court interpreted Section 2 in a case referred to as Brunovich versus DNC to place additional burdens, additional burdens on plaintiffs in voting rights cases. Our committees are working with various legal scholars, and some of them are on this call today. We are working with voting rights experts to determine the impact of the Brunovich decision and help develop a legislative response to this decision. And so I will classify this simply as a work in progress. Now, let me talk about section five. Some refer to it as section four. The other provision that we are concerned about is section five. Section five requires covered jurisdictions to submit proposed voting changes to the Department of Justice for preclearance. The Justice Department evaluates the proposed change and determines whether the change will be retrogressive or whether it will dilute minority voting strength in that jurisdiction. That's Section 5. Since 1965, Section 5 has worked well. It has worked quite well in preventing discriminatory voting changes from taking place. Section 5 is quick. It can be turned around in 60 days or less. The burden of proof in Section 5 submissions is on the jurisdiction, not on the challenges, but on the jurisdiction. And it has minimal cost associated with the submission. But as we all know, on June 25, 2013, uh, some eight years ago, uh, the Supreme Court, in a surprise pronouncement, ruled that Section 5 is necessary and constitutional to prevent discriminatory voting practices, but, but the court said the formula, which is section four, the formula that determines which jurisdictions are subject to preclearance was unconstitutional and in need of congressional revision. And the court said the revision, when it's done by Congress, must be based on current conditions, current conditions. This decision flew in the face of Congress's repeated and recent bipartisan reauthorizations of the act in recognition that current conditions did still require its protections. And all of those reauthorizations were signed into law by presidents, 
And President George Bush signed the most recent authorization, which I showed to you a moment ago in 2006, less than four years before Shelby County became, began its litigation. And so in doing our work, we must look at conditions. That's what the court requires us to do. We must look at conditions in 2013. We must look at conditions in 2021. Congress is required to gather a congressional record to determine if exceptional conditions still exist. And so my subcommittee, the Subcommittee on Elections, has been assembling an evidentiary record to support a re restoration of the Voting Rights Act, Section 5 or Section 4. I am pleased to announce, I am pleased to announce today that my committee, my subcommittee, uh, our Committee on, on Administration, House Administration, we've completed our work. It's done. Uh, we have completed our work. Uh, I, I have the report here. Uh, the subcommittee called more than 60 witnesses. We gathered several thousand pages of written testimony, documents, and transcripts. And we heard hours of oral testimony resulting in, in this report, which details a wide range of voting and election administration barriers implemented by states since the Shelby County decision. Many of the witnesses, many of them shared with us that racially motivated legislation has been passed by many states and more states are preparing to pass legislation that will disproportionately affect voters of color and have an adverse effect on voter participation. The record established by our subcommittee has now been delivered to the House Committee on the Judiciary chaired by Congressman Jerry Nadler. Chairman Nadler has completed five hearings, I am told, with one final hearing which is anticipated within the next two weeks. The combined legislative record from both committees will consist of thousands of pages of evidence that clearly demonstrates that Congress must act immediately to require jurisdictions who engage in bad conduct to submit voting changes to the Department of Justice for preclearance. The Committee on the Judiciary will write the legislation. It is not my committee that writes the legislation. I want to make that clear. It is the Committee on the Judiciary who will write the legislation. The, the Judiciary Committee undoubtedly will receive input from my subcommittee and from other interested members. It is my belief that the legislation will be completed. I'm not speaking for Mr. Nadler. It is just my belief, uh, but it's a, a, a well-grounded belief. It is my belief that the legislation will be completed and introduced in late August. If introduction happens according to the schedule, the House will be in a position very soon to vote on H.R. 4 and then send it over to the Senate for its consideration and passage. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you for listening. And uh, before I recognize my colleagues, I want to once again remind members of the media to utilize the Q&A function to pose their questions so staff will know to unmute you and recognize you when, when your turn is up. At this time, it is my pleasure to recognize my great friend from the state of California, Congressman Peter Aguilar, uh, who is also the vice chair of the House Democratic Caucus. Uh, Pete, take it away, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And when you were putting that picture uh, on on the screen for all of us, I was hoping that you had a picture of uh, of, of you and your dad uh, from uh, from the Senate gallery as well. But uh, maybe that'll be in the next round of, of archives. Uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, today marks the 56th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And in just the first seven months of 2021, 18 states have enacted more than 30 laws that restrict the ability to vote. These laws include burdensome voter ID laws, mail-in ballot restrictions, and more frequent voter roll purges. Republicans across the country are using these bills to further legitimize the former president's big lie. This is an assault on our democracy, and we need to call it what it is. To stop this anti-democratic wave, we passed HR1, the For the People Act, to reduce voting barriers, diminish the influence of big money in politics, and make elections more secure and fair. 
And during the last Congress, we also passed HR4, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. That bill protects future elections by restoring and strengthening voting rights of 1965 through the updated preclearance formula that you just articulated. This is a necessary response after the Supreme Court's Shelby versus Holder decision to ensure that communities of color can freely exercise their right to vote. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you because the report that you created provides ironclad evidence showing that in order to combat the voter suppression practices detailed in the report's findings, we must pass the Further People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act into law. Congress has a responsibility to safeguard all Americans' fundamental right to vote, and we must deliver these bills to the president's desk. With that, uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Aguilar. At this time, I recognize the gentlelady from New Mexico, Ms. Teresa F Ledger Fernandez. Thank you so much, Chairman Butterfield, and for your long history in protecting access to the ballot for everyone. As noted, I'm Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez, serving New Mexico's beautiful and beautifully diverse third congressional district. To those that would say voting is already free and open to all, read this report. It documents a post shall be intensified attack on a fundamental right of equal access to the ballot box. If you're a person of color or from a disadvantaged community, this report will reflect your experience in a way that white and affluent voters might not recognize. When writing the Constitution, the founders included the election clause giving Congress the authority to pass election laws. They were particularly concerned that the states would interfere with the people's ability to elect their representatives. John Adams described Congress as needing to be, quote, in miniature, an exact portrait of the people at large. It should think, feel, reason, and act like them, end quote. He cautioned that, quote, great care should be taken to affect this and to prevent unfair, partial, and corrupt elections. What are we looking at now? We can't have an exact portrait of the people if voters, and specifically voters of color, are forced to wait hours in line to vote, or if their polling place closes down, or they're purged from the voting rolls, if they are erased from the portrait. Just last year, we saw historic surges in voting by Latinos, Native Americans, Black Americans, and Asian Americans. An additional 7 million Latinos voted. Wow. Rather than celebrating and building upon that historic turnout, we see Republican-led states taking deadly aim, deadly aim at our ability to vote. So Congress must act to prevent the states from corrupting the elections as the framers foretold. Latinos make up close to half of the citizen population growth in the last decade close to half of the citizen population growth in the last decade. Those are the future voters. And this report documents how voting restrictions are aimed to make sure they don't vote. From longer wait times to closure of polls in their area to lack of language assistance to voter intimidation regarding citizenship and documentary proof at the polls. We heard testimony that non-white voters are six times as likely as white voters to wait more than 60 minutes to vote. This doesn't just make it difficult to vote in the current election. It also discourages future voting. It sets in motion a cycle of voter suppression that outlasts a single election. Native Americans who fought until the 1960s just to get the official recognition that they had the right to vote are forced to vote are forced forced to drive hours to polling sites places like north dakota disenfranchised thousands of native americans by requiring a voter id law that didn't take into account the lack of physical addresses on reservations where many get their mail by post office this report makes abundantly clear that congress not only has the authority to protect our elections but we must act swiftly to protect that precious right to vote in the 2022 elections. Passing HR1 and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act is not a partisan issue. 
our chairman just noted that it's never been a partisan issue. But you know what? Taking away equal access to the polls is un-American. It is un-American to defend voter suppression. So thank you to all of you for joining this press conference. We must all do our part to sound the alarm to protect the foundation of American democracy. Muchísimas gracias, Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady for her kind words and thank you for your passion and your voice. You've been out on the battlefield for a long time, even before you came to Congress. At this time, it is my pleasure to recognize a friend of, of long standing. Uh, Wade Henderson is the, let me get it right, he's the interim president and CEO of the Le Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Uh, welcome, Mr. Henderson, and you are now recognized. Thank you, Chairman Butterfield. Good morning, everyone. I'm Wade Henderson, Interim President and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Let me begin by thanking the House Administration Subcommittee on Elections and Chairman Butterfield, Representative Aguilar, Representative Legere Fernandez, uh, for their leadership and important work to develop the record on discrimination in voting and election administration practices so that Congress can best act to secure protect and defend the freedom to vote for all Americans. When President Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act 56 years ago today, he declared the law a uh, triumph and said, I quote, today we strike away the last major shackles of fierce and ancient bonds. But now the shackles of white supremacy still restrict the full exercise of our rights. It is up to Congress to once more fulfill the promise of our democracy for all. Protecting the right to vote freely and without discrimination has long been a bipartisan priority. The Voting Rights Act was passed with strong bipartisan support from, uh, support from both Republicans and Democrats, and the reauthorization of its enforcement for provisions were signed into law each time by Republican presidents we must continue that legacy today. But as the subcommittee report makes clear, some politicians are trying their hardest to take us backwards by creating barriers for black, brown, indigenous, and new Americans who want to exercise this fundamental right. These barriers include voter purging, polling place closures, and voter ID and proof of citizenship. In this perilous moment, we can't let up. We have no other choice if we want to ensure that every vote counts in our democracy. Congress must pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and restore the VRA to its full strength. Before his death, Congressman John Lewis wrote, and I quote, time is of the essence to preserve the integrity and promises of our democracy, unquote. All of us must now heed his call with all the force we can muster. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you very much, Mr. Henderson. At this time, I'm pleased to recognize Ms. Terry Menes, who is the Senior Director of Census and Voting Programs for the Asian American Advancing Justice Program. Thank you and welcome. Good morning. I am Terry L. Menes, Senior Director of Census and Voting Programs at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. I want to begin by echoing Wade's thanks to all of you um, and wanted to add my uh, thanks specifically to you, Chairman Butterfield, for allowing me a few moments to speak on today's program about the subcommittee's report and, in particular, the breadth and depth of evidence gathered by your subcommittee regarding ongoing discrimination that harms voters of colors, including Asian Americans. From states once subject to the Voting Rights Act, seeing voter purges at a 40% higher rate than the rest of the country, to polling place closures, consolidations, reductions, and long wait times at the polls negatively affecting voters of color at higher rates than white voters, this report documents the increase in, as well as the persistent use of, certain practices to impede participation by voters of color. Discriminatory practices in and changes to methods of elections, jurisdictional boundaries, and redistricting have been persistently used throughout history to decrease the ability of voters of color to elect representatives that reflect their voices and communities 
And as we enter the first round of redistricting without the full force protection of the Voting Rights Act, as you have all mentioned, um, it is certain that these problematic practices will not only continue, but increase. Indeed, the subcommittee's report makes clear the fact that voting and election administration practices that can be necessary and even required are too often used to impede the participation of voters of color by creating additional obstacles and harms to their ability to vote or elect candidates of choice. The specific practices detailed in the report that are being used to silence growing communities of color should be subject to additional scrutiny when being used in the context of a growing demographic shift. These findings buttress the need for the practice-based preclearance mechanism found in the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. I look forward to working with our congressional leaders, such as yourselves, to ensure that we address these problematic voting practices and that we restore and modernize the Voting Rights Act on this very day, the 56th anniversary of the signing of the VRA. Thank you. And thank you for your words and thank you for your passion and your voice. At this time, we will conclude with remarks from Mr. Tom Sines of that great organization called Malvel. Take it away, Tom. Thank, thank you, Chairman Butterfield. Uh, I'm Thomas Sines, President and General Counsel of MALDEF, the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. And I join my colleagues today in saying thank you and congratulations to the Subcommittee on Elections for this powerful report. It is a crucial and a powerful milestone on the now eight-year journey to undo the damage of the Shelby County decision. At MALDIF, in our 53 years of existence, we have litigated well over 100 cases relating to the voting rights of Latinos throughout the nation. And from that experience, we have seen what this report documents. Most important, we have seen in the last eight years following the Shelby County decisions, jurisdictions using the practices identified and documented in this report to suppress the voting rights of Latinos. I specifically point out our litigation to challenge an attempt to create new at-large seats on the city council of Pasadena, Texas, a change only contemplated and implemented after preclearance was removed from the state of Texas by the Shelby County decision. And I cite our litigation together with others against a voter purge in the state of Texas that clearly targeted newly naturalized Latino voters using a faulty process to identify purportedly fraudulent voter registrants. These experiences together with the others documented in your report demonstrate the imperative of reintroducing preclearance as a critical mechanism to protect the voting rights of all Americans. Preclearance has not only been a most effective means of defending voting rights, it is a shining example of positive alternative dispute resolution or ADR. ADR saves money, it saves time, it ensures that we can quickly act to prevent depredations of voting rights that would otherwise go forward and that would otherwise go unchallenged before an election or elections occur with those vote suppressive measures in place. ADR saves money primarily for the jurisdictions themselves that would otherwise be defendants in expensive and arduous litigation under Section 2. The fact is that this report that you've created and released today demonstrates conclusively the challenges that we face that promise only to become worse in future years because of the demographic changes that my colleague Terry mentioned. We will see jurisdiction after jurisdiction facing a growing minority voting coalition, and too many of them will react by seeking to suppress voting rights. We need preclearance to respond effectively to that challenge to our democracy. And today's report is an important step in that direction. Thank you, Chairman Butterfield. And thank you, Thomas Sines, and thank you for the great work that MALDEF does and has done now for, for many years. Let me now address the media to, to ask any, any question. Please utilize the Q&A function to pose your questions so that our wonderful staff will know to unmute you and to recognize you as appropriate. 
Now, this is always the difficult part of a virtual press conference, but we're going to try to make it work. Uh, staff, are there any questions at this time? Yes, there is. First question is from Tia Mitchell with uh, AJC. Tia, you're unmuted. Hello, thank you for recognizing me. My question is to Representative Butterfield. I know you said that the Judiciary Committee is going to be writing the legislation, but based on what you and your committee have heard, I wanted to know if you had any recommendations. For example, um, when it comes to preclearance, do you think that it should only apply to those previous states and jurisdictions that were under preclearance um, before Shelby? Should it apply to all states? What is? What are your thoughts? Yes, uh, thank you for asking that question. As I said in my opening statement, my committee has absolute jurisdiction over HR 1 and we've exercised that jurisdiction. We've passed for the People Act and we have sent it over to the Senate. We are awaiting action. But for HR 4, it's, it's somewhat different. My committee, our committee, House Administration, the Election Subcommittee, uh, we do not have original bill writing authority to write the John Lewis Advancement Act. Uh, what our responsibility is, is to collect the evidence, to build a congressional record, and that we have done. Uh, and that voluminous information has now been delivered to the House Committee on, on the Judiciary. Uh, House Judiciary has completed five hearings, I think it is. Chairman Nadler tells me that he has one more hearing that needs to be completed, and perhaps that can be completed within the next two weeks. And then we will have the totality of, of the evidence. We cannot begin to talk about and to draft and write a bill without knowing what the four corners of the evidence will be. Uh, if we begin to prematurely write the bill, uh, that would be in violation of the intent and spirit of the Supreme Court's decision. But once we get it in place, then we will decide whether to use some of the thinking in the last H.R. Uh, 4 bill or whether we want to wipe the slate clean and, and, and craft a brand new formula based on current conditions. And so I'm sorry, I'm not able to, to give you a precise answer because we are not able to have the benefit of all of the evidence. The final hearing may include many other experts that we need to hear from. Yes, next up is Nick Wu with Politico. Hi there, thank you so much for holding this. I just had a question about the timing of this. I mean, Chairman Butterfield, you mentioned that this might be coming at the very end of August. I mean, the House isn't back for a little bit uh, more in September, I believe, right? So are you concerned at all that this bill might be passed too late to affect redistricting going into the fall? No, I, I was hoping that the bill would be completed before now, but, but we have to be very deliberate in, in the way we do this. And, and we've had to, to collect the evidence over a period of months. And the Judiciary Committee, and I might say the Senate Judiciary Committee, has, has been doing the same thing. Uh, we want to get it signed into law, obviously, before redistricting starts, uh, because many states are going to be uh, discriminatory in the way they, they draw their redistricting maps. But hopefully we can get it introduced during a pro forma session uh, during the month of August. Remember that bills can be introduced uh, during pro forma. And, and if by chance we, we have to come back and vote on uh, some other unrelated legislation, perhaps we can vote on HR 4 uh, at that time. But if, if, if Congress, if the House does not return during the month of August for other reasons, then I can anticipate reasonably that we may be able to vote on this during the week of September 20th. But that is not my decision. That is, a, that is a leadership decision that will be made by the majority leader, Mr. Hoyer, and of course, the Speaker of the House. Thank you. Mr. Butterfield, the last question today is from Grace Panetta with Insider. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for doing this call. Um, a question for any of the members or voting rights advocates here. Um, in terms of the process after this gets through the House and goes to the Senate, obviously, Senator Manchin is one of the leading advocates for H.R. 4 in the Senate and has brought Senator Murkowski as the sole Republican supporter of this bill. But um, in interviews this week, both he and Sen Senator Sinema have reiterated that they don't support changes to the filibuster rules specifically for voting rights because they fear it could be used against the Democrats later if Republicans gain control of Congress. So I'm wondering if any of you had any thoughts or reactions to those arguments. 
Yeah, let, let me get it started and then I will uh, yield to our friends from, from the civil rights community. Uh, that's, that's a very important question and I've been thinking about it over the last few weeks. I've been talking with my colleagues uh, constantly about it, members of the CHC and the C Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, and, and this is my take on it and, and thank you for asking it. It's a very relevant question. I, I'm confident that Senator Manchin is committed to protecting the voting rights of voters of color in every respect. I'm confident of that. I know Senator Manchin, I know his background, uh, I know how he thinks and how he, how, how he wants, the direction he wants this country to go. Uh, I am prayerful that Senator Manchin will read H.R. 4. Uh, he will look at the long history that we've had in this country of, of vote dilution and vote denial, uh, uh, all the way back to, to Reconstruction. Uh, and I'm sure he will conclude that passage of H.R. 4 will prevent jurisdictions that have bad motives, and not all jurisdictions have bad motives. Uh, There's some good actors and some bad actors, uh, but I'm confident that he will understand that we need to prevent jurisdictions who have bad motives from passing election laws that make it more difficult to vote. And I'll, I'll go ahead and say this. And it's my hope that Senator Manchin can persuade 10 of his Republican colleagues to vote for this legislation. Uh, the Republican members of the Senate have great respect for Senator Manchin, as, as do the Democratic uh, senators. And I believe that Senator Manchin can persuade 10 of his Republican colleagues to join with him in voting for this legislation to make it bipartisan. Now, having said that, um, if, if that doesn't happen, there is another solution, uh, and that is to modify the Senate rules to enable a simple majority to pass this legislation. I hope they should not, we should not have to, they should not have to resort to changing the rules, but please know it's been done before. Uh, you will know that the blue slip and the filibuster uh, do not apply to blue slips, for example, for circuit court nominees and the like. But I, I, I'm holding out hope. I'm holding out hope that once we write the formula, and, and Mr. Nadler writes the formula uh, for H.R. 4, that Senator Manchin, the other 49 Democratic senators, and at least 10 Republican senators will embrace this legislation. Uh, hope springs eternal, and that's where I am on this. Let me yield to Mr. Henderson to, to pick it up from here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. And Ms. Panetta, let me uh, support uh, completely the remarks of Chairman Butterfield. I would add only one additional point. And that is to remind you and others on the call that the last reauthorizations of the Voting Rights Act were always bipartisan, signed into law by Republican presidents. The last vote that was taken uh, in the Senate uh, in 2006 was 98 to nothing. In the House, it was three, uh, 90 to 33. We have had overwhelming bipartisan support for the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. And we believe that nothing should change in the way in which Congress reviews uh, the bills currently. So I'm quite optimistic that at the end of the day, Senator Manchin and others will be able to develop the bipartisan support necessary to have this bill reauthorized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. I'm told that we are running out of time, but uh, I've been in Congress for 17 years and I know uh, when members join a call like this, uh, they want an opportunity to respond to questions. And so I'm going to open it up for one additional question, and then I will throw that one to Mr. Aguilar and to Ms. Uh, Ledger Fernandez. Uh, let's try another question, Staff. Uh, Mr. Butterfield, there are no further questions. So if there's any closing remarks, All right. All right. Saved, by, saved by the bell. Saved <laughs> by Concluding the remarks, Pete. Take it away. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank you for, for your leadership and, and for uh, the groups and organizations who were on this call, um, uh, on the Zoom. Uh, thanks for your continued advocacy. Uh, we could not be effective without the work of, of your organizations uh, to help uh, not only build the testimony and build the case, uh, because uh, all of you are familiar faces to House administration, um, but to help share with the American public. Uh, the importance uh, of voting rights and the importance of the Voting Rights Act uh, that, that we are undertaking and the work that the chairman uh, has led. Um, and now there's a lot of work left in the Senate and in the full house and in the Judiciary Committee. Uh, but this has been a key building block. And so I wanna thank Chairman Butterfield because we're, we're making the case here and we're building uh, the case. So House Judiciary uh, and the full house and Senate uh, can act. So uh, thanks for your continued advocacy and, and look forward to continuing to 
to make progress um, and to see this through. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. So I would point out in slight response to the last question that this report isn't just work that we did. Right. This report comes out of a lot of work that the organizations have done, that experts have done, and that people on the ground have done. And so in terms of pushing that arc of justice, which takes a lot of work to bend it towards justice, right? That arc of history takes all of our work. And so not only are we working to make sure that this gets passed in the Senate, but we know that thousands and millions of people in our communities are asking the senators to pass this. I get asked about voting rights when I'm asked about when I'm asked about immigration, when I'm asked about you know the the infrastructure bill, when I'm asked about everything, it always comes back to people asking me. What about voting rights? Because they recognize that that is the essence of our democracy and how we get things passed that the American people support overwhelmingly, and so we are being aided and we are not being aided we are being supported and pushed by millions of people on the ground and that's how this is going to get through the senate and i thank everybody for being as concerned as we are uh, about making sure that our democracy remains strong again i want to thank all of you for joining us today for this very important press conference as we celebrate uh, this 56th anniversary of the enactment, the signing of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. The VRA has transformed the political landscape of America, and it's important that it remain viable and enforceable. Uh, the Voting Rights Act uh, is, is still the law of the land. Uh, it has been it has been impeded somewhat because of the court's ruling uh, regarding Section 4 and Section 5. Uh, it has also been impacted because of the recent ruling in, in uh, Arizona concerning uh, uh, Section 2 and its enforceability and how it's to be interpreted by the courts. Uh, but we, we, we intend to fully address all of the concerns that the court has, has raised. And so thank you for joining us today. And I wish all of you a happy 56th anniversary on the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Thank you.